and I had my, the way that the, 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 the bunks worked, you could slide paper in. And I used to just lay there and just look at, like I wrote down goals, I'd lay there and just look at the goals. So you just put a sheet of goals above your bed? Yeah, and I'd just lay there. Every time I went to bed, I'd just be looking at it. And then when I wake up, I'd look at it. So every time I'd see it. Jason Day as a guest on Break3, where I'm hoping we're gonna talk to him about two different moments in his career, really just the beginning of his career. Like, what what was it that allowed him to go from, you know, really unassuming Australian background as a Queenslander to the PGA Tour? Serious underdog breakthrough moment. And then also, what allowed him to get back? You got kitted up quickly yeah, there. Dude. No, I already had a good man. How are you? Good. The big cat was in there, so I tiger bits preference. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have Jason Day. Welcome to, to Breakthrough. Thanks. Um, so today I kind of just want to get you to walk us through a couple different key points in your life that, that have made you who you are and have gotten you to this point. But I guess where I want to start is is pretty much at the beginning because I would love to get your perspective on why you think you became an elite professional golfer. <laughs> and it's not like you grew up in a, from what I understand, you know, a, a country club household where everyone played golf and you had access to everything. Like what was, how did golf begin to have a role in your life? <clears throat> so my, we lived on a farm in Bow Desert uh, and that's in Queensland, which is like central East coast where Bow Desert is central East coast of Australia. And at the time, my dad um, was just getting over being an alcoholic and um, we were living out the farm. We were like kind of, you know, raising some cattle and, 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 and sheep and we weren't very well off. My dad worked in the meatworks for the, for the longest time. So he was a meat worker and we would uh, go down to the landfill to find, try and find stuff that we can use, potentially use around the house. And I was really, really small. So, you know, I was like three, four years old at the time. Um, and my dad, at the, you know, he went to the landfill and found a golf club just sticking up out of the, out of the trash and bought it home. Cause I always like hitting things, you know what I mean? I just cricket bat, cricket ball, um, just throwing stuff. I mean, any, any boy that, you know, just likes to hit stuff. So. He ended up giving it to me and I hit, you know, a ball and a tennis ball at the time. I hit it and he's like, the swing was actually pretty good apparently. And he turned around, turned around to my mom and said, you know, this guy's got to be a champion one day. And then fast forward, there's like certain things along the way that had like kind of unfolded and happened in my life. We, we moved around because my mom ultimately ended up working for the Meatworks as well. My dad went back to work for the Meatworks um, and we moved from Bow Desert to Rockhampton. Once I got to Rockhampton, um, that's when I kind of really, I found really good group of friends with yeah. my next door neighbor. I got him into, uh, into golf and he ended up ultimately turning professional, um, as a club pro. And I would sit and I'd run home after, um, you know, after school and wait for him so we could, I could ride my bike with him. Cause I, at the time I was still small. I was in primary school. Um, I'd wait for him. We could ride our bikes together and I'd drag the, we'd drag our clubs behind it. Cause in Australia we have those. You know, those pull carts. Pull carts, yeah. yeah. So I'd, we'd both be riding and we'd go and play until dark and then ride home and do that every single day. So it's kind of crazy. What was that first club? It was a three wood. Like a, it was like a cut down, like kind of like a women or a, like a, I don't even know if it's if it's a woman's club, but um, it was it was cut down. I still got it. I got it in my barn at home in Ohio. 
Yeah. And were you an adept athlete otherwise? Were you a good cricketer as a, you know, four, or, five, six I, year I was, old, however old you were? No, nah, not really. I, <laughs> I would say that I like, I mean, if, in, in multi sports, I'm like half decent, but yeah. like I just never played a lot, enough sports to, and I always just gravitated towards golf, and that's just how, how, how everything happened. Yeah. And you've talked about your dad was tough on you, right? As yeah. a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like if I didn't, and th I think this is pro probably part of the reason why, um, uh, why I know my focus is, is the way that it is and how I had to concentrate is just because like, if I didn't concentrate or if I didn't play well, then I get a clip around the ears pretty. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was quite, it was, it was obviously abusive. So, um, but I mean, I've kind of blocked that part out of my life, which is probably not the healthiest thing, but, um, it actually helped me golf wise to like know that, Hey, if I don't play well, something's going to happen. Typically not good. So, um, yeah, that was just part, that's just how my dad was. I mean, he was just, he was really rough. He was, um, divorce twice married three times just that kind of kind of a bloke and yeah um yeah very hard meat working dude yeah but but somehow you still kept a positive relationship with golf for some reason it didn't matter like what he what he did to me i always wanted to play golf yeah i don't know why. what was it about it but don't know man like i don't i honestly don't know because like like i think it was just because I had a really good group of friends at the golf course and, you know, I had friends at school, but like, it wasn't like, I'd rather go and play golf and hang out with my friends there and, and play. And I actually was, it's hard because when you're a kid and you're like kind of half decent or something, like you want to play it more. And I was just like fully, fully involved in it. Like I loved it so much because I was, I was pretty, pretty good at it. So then yeah. that's, I think what kept me moving forward. And then, um, you know, kind of fast forward, like my dad, passes away from stomach cancer and then I start going down a pretty uh you know pretty rough road my, my sister ran away from home for like four years so she was like kind of living in the streets and stuff um well, after my dad passed away um my elder sister was always the one that kind of kept it together um for the most part and then you know I was I was like starting to go down this this road of like drinking and getting in fights at school and stuff like that. And that was just not what my mum wanted me to, to go down. So she made like the ultimate sacrifice to, you know, send me to boarding school, which that's where I met my first coach, Cole. Yeah. And did that pull you out of it? Just being put in a new situation with new people around you? And it, so it, it taught me to grow up very, very quick. Um, and we were in at the JBD, the junior boys dorm, uh, at Corralman cause I went to two boarding schools cause the first one closed down, but at the JBD there was, there must've been 60 kids in one dorm and like everyone used to like sleep and then like you'd everyone wake up at the same time. It was just kind of crazy cause we'd sit there and just talk to one another and everyone's going there. Majority of the guys are going there because of golf. So yeah. Uh, but it was still mayhem there. It wasn't as if you were going off to the, to a quiet boarding school. Oh, dude, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're in the middle of nowhere and kids get into, I remember one story, one, one kid, he's like, like smuggling in alcohol and he gets to the front door and decides to like trip on something and drop it right in the front. Like, and this thing I can't remember what it was. It might have been like scotch or something like that. As soon as it, as soon as it landed, you it it reeked of alcohol. You could smell it, and and we're like, he's done, he's done. He got expelled. Oh, um, so it's just like stuff like that. Where, yeah. But like, it, there's enough things out there because you're because you're in the middle of nowhere. It was it was good because all you did was play golf. You know what I mean? Like it, there are things that you you definitely get yourself into trouble. Yeah. Certain things, but like I was so young still that like I didn't really all those distractions that potentially could happen was wasn't even on my mind because I wanted to play golf. Now, granted, it took just a little bit of time for me to like understand the situation that my mum was in and to recognize that like she sacrificed a lot of 
a lot of things and my sister sacrificed a lot of things to, for me to to go to this school and then after that then i was just like all in golf like let's focus and and stuff like that but it really didn't happen until like that school closed and i went to to the next school which is hills which was only like 45 minutes away that's how you know that's when i started really kicking on and playing really good golf were you always head and shoulders above your your peer group and everyone around you or did that take time that it took time but it was because i always I always say that like my caddy luke he, he's my he was my uh roommate at hills and i always say that he was better and he always say no i wasn't better but like he like he was because he was the first guy that I ever watched get up at four o'clock, four thirty, and go and practice. Wow! And I always ask him, like, "Why'd you stop?" And he's like, "He goes because I was doing it. I wasn't getting better." <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, "I just went, decided to go to sleep." Yeah. Um, and that's kind of when I like he did that for a long, long time. And that, and then that's when I decided. I read a book. He's the guy that gave me the book about Tiger Woods. Changed my life. I'm like, okay, well, Tiger's shooting. At 13 years old, 14 years old, he's shooting 68s and 67s, and why am I shooting 72s, 73s? Yeah, kind of thing. And then the the facilities that we had at Hills um, was off the charts. Like it was it was unbelievable. Like he, the short game facility was massive. Like the putting green was massive. We had a massive uh, driving range, so everything was right there. We had about 75 kids in 75, 80 kids in like the on the golf side of things. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was incredible. And then that's when I, like, after I read the book about Tiger, that's when I started getting up and, and, um, practicing, you know, getting up at 4.30, going to practice five, kind of stuff like that. But like, I got up to like 30, just over 30 hours a week of, of actual golf practice, wow. which are like full-time a, a, job, full-time job. And that was like, that was like a, a more of a pride thing for me to like go hey look this is how much i'm working kind of thing and and i yeah. didn't want to rub it in people's faces but i'm like hey like if anyone asked me like why you're successful i'm like well i'll show you and then i, I would have it listed down and i have like it's funny like talking about like writing stuff down like i remember saying in the bottom bunk and i had my the way that the the the, the bunks worked you can slide paper in and i used to just lay there and just look at, like, I wrote down goals. I'd lay there and just look at the goals. So you just put a sheet of goals above your bed. Yeah, and i just lay there. Every time I went to bed, I'd just be looking at it. And then when I wake up, I'd look at it. So every time I'd see it, you know. Do you mean? remember what was on there? It was just, like, whatever the year's tournaments were. Like, hey, Got I want to win this. I want to do yeah. that. I want to, like, um, try and average a certain amount of, like, you know, my scoring average. I want, like, a certain amount of greens, whatever it was. Like, it was stuff like that to try and hit. But, like, it was just, like... Every day I woke up, it's like right there. You know what I mean? I go to sleep, it's right there. So it's it was nice. And at the time, like there, once again, like Hills was in the middle of nowhere. Like, um, yeah, you could, we used to go like every now and then we used to go down the blue light di blue light disco. It's kind of funny, call it blue light disco. But um, it was just like a, a little area where um, everyone would come and I guess underage people would go and dance and listen to music. I don't know, but yeah. it was kind of. We snuck out a few times, snuck in, back in. We got caught one time and then we ran back in and we like, we had, a, we got a phone call because at the time, like we didn't have any iPhones or anything. Like, we got a call on like a crappy cell phone. They're like, oh, door master's looking, looking, looking for you, you guys are screwed. So we're like, and the security guard, cause they, they locked the gates at night. The security guard is driving in his car, looking through the looking looking through the trees and stuff and i'm like will mcgill my my buddy is running in front of me i think luke is behind me and we're running through the bushes trying to get away from the security yard i see will bent over i'm like what is he bent over he ran into a barbed wire fence oh no cut himself all everywhere and then we both jump and then we're like laying like this because the security guard comes by because the golf course like wrapped around the school and the, and the road goes straight through the uh, through the golf course, and we're laying like this in a bunker, and the, you can see the light shining, yeah, shining like this. And then we go and and Cole Swato, my coach, is is staying there for some reason. And we're like, hey man, like what what should we do? We're like screwed. And he's like, he goes, just go to your dorm, go go to your room, and we'll work it out. And um, we go in there and we're acting like we're asleep, 
and in the dorm master goes, he goes, I know you snuck out, I know you're awake. And then he, and we didn't say a word, we just like, <laughs> acted like we're asleep. And uh, we, we ultimately got into a little bit of trouble, but we, we were fine in the end. If you'd gotten caught in that bunker, that could have been it. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. It was uh, all good things. But like, once again, like getting back to it, like going to a boarding school was a good thing for me because it taught me like how to grow up and, and what you had to do, like wash, how to wash clothes and, and how to cook for yourself and all that mm-hmm. stuff too. So I grew up pretty quick. So by the time I was 18, um, I never wanted to go to college over here. Um, and college is like something that you can potentially do if you're not mature enough. But I was beyond that because I experienced it young. So I was ready to turn professional. It's amazing to me how you sort of went through some of these stages so much earlier than some other people. Yeah. I mean, you know, drinking too much, fighting people. Like yeah. if, you, if you say that to me, I think, oh, maybe someone's 18 or they're 23. Or yeah. You were like 13. The, yeah, 13. The pl- yeah, the place that I was in Rockhampton, where I was at was kind of... It was a little rough, yeah. Yeah. It was a little rough, but like it wasn't, it wasn't crazy, but it was a little rough. <laughs> um, you don't strike me now as a fighter. You strike me nah, more man, as more I, of a lover it, than a fighter. I, getting hit in the face is not fun. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, and mind you, like, I, I think at the time I was just like, because I lost my dad and I didn't know how to react to it. Yeah. And even though like he was abusive and yeah, he was, he was tough, but like I, he was my dad, you know what I mean? So it was just kind of, I didn't know how to react. And I was like, 12 and i've never talked to anyone about the like there was no counseling or anything like that back then it was just like hey your dad died go go get on with it go yeah get on with it so that's kind of how i did i got on with it and i didn't know how to like emotionally like understand it all and i just kind of just came out wrong and then that's when my mum kind of you know, made that ultimate sacrifice for putting me to a boarding school, which ended up working out great in the end, yeah. which was good, so. So when you think about getting to ultimately, you know, world number one, the PGA Tour, all the success that you've had, how do you kind of divide that between, I don't know, natural talent, hard work, Work, right place, right time. It sounds like work is a huge emphasis. Work is for work you. is huge. Yeah, yeah, work is 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 important. Like you, I feel like I, I feel like work ethic is really really difficult to teach these days. Um, and that's one thing that I'm always trying to to show that my kids that you know my my work ethic and because even though my my dad was a hard worker, like we and my my mum was a hard worker. Like they to go to the meatworks, they were they were gone by five five thirty in the morning. So my sister, yeah. who was like ten at the time, she's raising us, like getting us ready for school and all that stuff. So it was kind of like seeing that, and then like like I understood my my, my seeing my parents work hard. I'm like it just kind of was instilled in me. Um, and then yeah, I don't know. It's just it's something that I've always done. And then obviously Cole, my my first coach, mm-hmm. my who got me to the tour and everything like that he was big on on really really like smart hard work but like a lot of a lot of work so and and it was like to the point where hey if you're practicing let's say you know wedges for you know two hours a week and then all of a sudden you go down to one hour a week well there's less repetitions there there's less time there and at some point it'll just it'll catch up and then I'm like, well, okay, well, if I do that, then I add 15, 20, 30 minutes more, then that means I'm going to get better. And then it just all of a sudden I'm practicing 10 hours a day kind of thing. So I don't know. It's just, yeah, there's, there is luck involved for sure. Um, because golf is funny like that. You need some luck to win tournaments and stuff. And I remember playing the Nationwide uh, Tour went down to, uh, Australia and we're playing the Corn Ferry it's actually Corn Ferry now but Nationwide Tour went down to Australia I finished like 31st or something like that in the first one down in Kuyonga in South Australia and my buddy Dave he finished second um, and he, we were both the youngest guys on the tour uh, on the US t- PGA Tour the next year but um, I go to New Zealand and I'm missing the cut I'm like oh crap I'm, I'm going to miss a cut 
and I'm I'm just laying in bed, and Ian, who works for my agent, Bud, he walks in. He's like, "Hey, man, like, if Dave Diaz double bogeys the last hole, you're in the you're in the field. I mean, you're in the you're in the weekend." I'm like, "Okay, it's we are like when we woke up that 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 morning, it was blow blowing a hurricane. It was it was like unbelievable, like." The worst conditions you can potentially have. Granted, the day before was okay. Then yeah. the more the next morning, because we there was like stop and starts because of certain weather and like the, the, we were, I think they ran out of daylight, so they had to come back the next day. Dave Diaz like comes back and double bogeys, lets a bunch of guys in. So I'm one of those guys. End up finishing sixth pl- sixth place. I play really good over the weekend, yeah. finish six. And at the time, I was I had conditional status, so it was like I just need a little bit of money and finishing six reshuffled my, my number and I could get into a bunch of tournaments and then from there I like played really, really good. So there's just been a number of little things like luck involved with that. That opened that, doors for That opened doors for sure, for sure. I want to fast forward, unfortunately, through just one of the great runs of modern guys <laughs> um, past that. Yeah. Past how good you played in 2015 and 2016. Yeah. To a moment where I remember hearing you just walking by an interview you were doing it at Augusta a few years ago, and where you were saying, you know, I don't just want to get back to world number one. I want to stay there for even longer this time than than initially. And I think you know maybe you just slipped outside the the top fifty in the world, and I was just like, wow, the the confidence and the resolve to not just think that, but to say that out loud. Right. I thought was really striking and because you know you you fell ultimately what outside the top 150 in the world and I don't yeah, know like if it always felt like it yeah. but but it was certainly a drop from where you'd been so oh, yeah. where did you find where did you find it within yourself to say no I, I can be the best player in the world I can be one of the elite players well, in the world in that moment I think I think ultimately I know that I can because I've, I've been there before um uh and I don't know. It's just like, it's, it's, it's a goal of mine. So if you said, Hey, I want to put, I want to lose some weight. You don't need to lose weight. But like, if you said, <laughs> if you said, I, I, I need to lose maybe, weight and yeah. then you, you set it out to people like, Hey, I'm losing, I'm going to lose. Then you're accountable for those, for those words. So, and that's the same thing as like, Hey, like I'm putting my goal out to everyone to, to know that, Hey, I'm, this is my goal and it's okay. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to try and, uh, to, to get back there. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but it's not from the lack of trying and work, hard work. Um, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to get back there. But but it all it's more of a like self-motivator. You know, when you put something out there like that, you, you're you like going, okay, I need to do it. Now, granted, there's a lot of people that put a lot of things out there and then don't follow through because they don't sure. either like really believe in it or they like just say it because they want to say it and that's what people need. They think people like want to hear from you, but like, for me, it's like, no, I want to get back to number one because I know what it felt like to get back there. I know how hard I had to work to get back there. I know um, what it was like when I was there and I would make uh, like certain tweaks and changes um, once I get back there to, to ultimately stay there a lot longer than what I did, which was like about a year. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I think that's why some people don't, don't feel comfortable working as hard as as you've been talking about to begin with right is because what if you work that hard and and nothing happens and it well, doesn't work right yeah, there's a fear I, of putting yourself out there that you yeah, see no, to, no to I understand yeah I do I, I definitely understand that but like you have to uh, you have to believe in the team you have that they're this they're, they're steering you in the right direction you have to believe in your ability to be able to get there because if you don't like granted there's like a lot of guys on the tour that are happy to be 70th in, in FedEx. You know, yeah. that's that's just like, it's well documented because it's like you're earning a very, very good living. It's very easy. You're not much in the spotlight. You know, you can kind of come in and out. You know, it's the pressure's like not really like a lot there. You're getting like decent chunk of change like outside of golf uh, from sponsors and all that yep. stuff. So like life is very, very simple. But it's more about like, like when you get to number one when you win tournaments it's like the dopamine hit that hits you do you know what i mean like and like i get the same feeling when i'm working hard 
I get the same dopamine hit and I'm like, oh man, I want that. And that's why I work hard because I'm like, every time I succeed, then I get the dopamine hit and then I, I, I um, work hard and I get the same feeling. So it's just like, it's just feeding itself over and over again. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, when you're sitting down and you're going, you're trying to plan out like a career. So, so for instance, anyone that like is starting out, they're like, okay, do, do I have the game? You can say yes or no. There's some some guys out there that have like really, really good game already and can get to number one in the world based off how they are. Um, and then there's some guys that they can't and they have to develop it. Now, granted, that takes that takes a lot of um a lot of strength to be able to sit there and go, okay, well, I'm 70th in FedEx. How do I get to number one in the world? Okay, these are the steps that I need to get. I need to get my green regulation up. I need to chip better. I need to putt better. Well, okay. If I do that, how much more time do I need to work? And also like, do I have the correct people in place to be able to push me in the right direction for that? And are my priorities straight? Because do I have a wife? Do I have kids? Do I, you know what I mean? I like, is everyone on board for me to be able to really kind of capture this moment? Because being number one in the world is like a real, is a lifestyle choice. Like you have to wake up every single day and go, I'm planning to be number one in the world or I am number one in the world. I have to do this every single day. I have to do, I have to be disciplined in my body. I have to be disciplined in my, my, my nutrition. I have to be disciplined in, in whatever it is, my mental side. Um, and it's, you have to dedicate and give yourself to that. And certain things around you have to sacrifice a little bit. But I think the biggest thing for me is like, I've got, you know, three things in my life that are important to me, family, health, and golf. And if nothing feeds into any of those and is a distraction, I'm not going to do it. That's just plain and simple. So I, I've got those three things that like are, are the pillars of my life and I've just got to make sure that I take care of each one of those. And then if that's the case and, and I do, and I get back to number one and I feel like I can, I, I know I can do it. I just got to I think the one thing that's probably holding me back the most right now and, and that's getting over the all the stuff that comes with being number one in the world. And like we obviously don't want to shoot with Tiger Woods here today and he was the best at it. Um, but that's that's when it comes back to the pillars, you know, if if it family fam, obviously family is huge. My uh, my health is massive because that's obviously what keeps me in the game and then um, you know, golf is 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 important. Like, and if it doesn't feed any of those things, then, I'll, then I, I, like I said before, I'm not interested. Yeah. So if a spot opens up on like my buddy's ski weekend, you're, you're probably not the guy to turn to. No. Uh, is there a moment that you can point to a feeling, a position in your, in your 60 degree swing from 50 yards? Like, is there a specific thing that you felt like was a breakthrough moment in this latest comeback? I mean, you haven't gotten to num world number one yet. Yeah. But you got back to the, the top 20 after being outside the top 170. Yeah. Uh, was, there, was there one specific thing that happened or, or no, I, I, I think I, I always chat to, um, I'm, I'm trying to create neural connections in my head um, based off like my swing changes, my putting changes, my, my short game changes. And I'm trying to make those connections stronger because it takes time to build that up. Uh, so if I start from where I was two years ago with Chris and my swing was the way that it was, and then I'm trying to change through like repetitions and stuff like that, looking at my swing and, and constantly talking about it, like constantly visualizing my swing, um, that stuff changes like, and it doesn't change overnight. It like has to, you'll be you'll, like, it's funny. I was talking to a buddy last night about his swing and like he's just going down this start in this journey too. And I'm like two years into it. I'm like, dude, like this is going to be the greatest journey of your life. Like, I mean, this is really like, you're going to absolutely love it because on top of it, you're going to not only understand your body more, you're going to understand your swing more. You're going to like, you're essentially, and I always thought like, it's going to be funny when people say, I really want to own my swing. And I never really understood it. Like I understand it now to a certain degree that you're just trying to like come up 
not come up, but like you're trying to swing it in a way that when things go bad, you do not, you know exactly what what's going on. Like what causes this shot, what causes that shot, re react to it, and then like let's get back to playing really, really good golf. But I said, I told him, I said this this journey is going to be the greatest journey for you, man. This is this is like I'm, I was actually jealous a little bit because I'm like ah, oh, you know, I had the, when I started that because when I started my my swing changes, it was like complete heartache all the time and like frustration mm -hmm. because i'd look at it and i'm like why can't i just get this in position this p certain position and then i i i ta and i've taken a lot of videos of my swing i look at <laughs> i look i've got thirteen thousand uh videos on my on my phone oh, we got yeah. enough storage space oh yeah i got one terabyte it's fine we're good um and i look at from the time that i um started and i look at the like the timeline of it and i'm just like man it's just amazing to see the changes and not only the changes in the swing, the changes in my body and how it moves. Like I can see um, how my, my, you know, my hips are working, how like compared to like my upper body and all these, all these other things. I can get into this. This could be a whole segment of this because like I'm <laughs> yeah. like deep, deep into it. Like I've, I've, I've jumped headfirst into this rabbit hole. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, when you when you get, kind of get to understand it a little bit more like that, then it's and to it's more of a mindset attitude adjustment where you're going, okay, this is more of a journey for me. It's not like, hey, I need it right now. Yeah, I do want it. I do want it right now. But it's like golf you can play for a long time, and it's more of a journey, kind of a life journey thing. Last thing, then, will there be a certain moment of satisfaction when you now that you can go back and play the Century Tournament? in Hawaii now that you're a winner again it, yeah. does that feel like a significant marker on this journey uh where you can stop and say all right I'm not quite all the way where I want to get yeah. to but damn I, I I accomplished something pretty cool I think so I think it'd be good like I love Hawaii it's one of my favorite tournaments of the year of it just because it's Hawaii and you get to go back and it's it's just a good place to start but um major championships is is where I want to be yeah that's like Getting back and winning, you know, multiple major championships and 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 competing in those, because that's ultimately why you you practice so much and you work so hard is to put yourself in the at the highest level under the under the most stress and to see if you can if you can handle it. That's that's ultimately why. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah, century's gonna be good, but like major championships next, so. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jason. Thanks Appreciate for taking it. us on the journey. Thanks. Sounds like you work also just to work. You, you like it. I love it, dude. Yeah. Oh, I, I freaking love it, man. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I don't, I can't stop. I, I'm glad I have golf in my, in my life. Um, because it's, it's, it's truly an addiction. <laughs> yeah. Who knows where else that output would go. Yeah, awesome. exactly. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Jason. It, really appreciate thanks. it.